there is something about her work that even today has a power almost to make one squirm inwardly. And the courage with which she can act, but also the courage and the humour with which she can act and not exactly make fun of herself, but almost defy the audience to make fun of her. She was really one of the first women artists or women photographers that really started to confront the, um, the anxiety of seeing oneself in photographs. I think the problem with photography as it stands now is that when we look at a picture of ourselves, we try and make it do too much work. I think the whole of our society tries to push us to a notion of coherence in who we are. Just Spence was a British photographer, a writer, an educator, although she was quite ambivalent about the name artist. She took on the definition of cultural sniper. So the idea of a cultural sniper is that she was aware that as a single person, that as an individual person, she could not change a culture. But like a sniper, what she could do is use her skills with the camera, with words, and with people to actually target specific areas, which in a sense she could take down. <laughs> She has this brilliant self-portrait of herself as a cultural sniper, although she hasn't got a gun, she's got a, a, an old-fashioned sling. Maybe as a reference to David and Goliath. This sense that even somebody quite small can actually have important consequences. She was from a working class family. Both her parents worked in factories and she left school at 13. But her parents who wanted something better for her, um, sent her to secretarial college. And in the 1950s, she became a secretary in a photographic studio. I joined a camera club and started to specialize in photographing cute children. And from that, I went straight into being a high street photographer. And I worked for a while in advertising. And as a high street photographer, I was producing happy families and doing portraits, passports, anything that came through the door, basically, because you've got to pay the rent. And, of course, the main big money spinner was weddings. And at some point, I gave all that up. I just got fed up with it. And I became a documentary photographer. But it became a real problem for me because I was beginning to question the ethics of photographing other people in order to make a living out of it. So as somebody who was reflecting on the role that photography took in society and also reflecting on her own practice, past and present, as a photographer, she started to look at her own family album. And in doing that, she started to open the family album to things that are normally excluded. So, for example, the bad photographs the photographs taken late at night when she's tired, or photographs taken for an insurance claim when um, her face had been singed in an accident at home. And what it seems the family album does is to tell the story from the adult's point of view, but particularly from a patriarchal point of view. And, I mean, the, I've looked at thousands of family albums and there doesn't seem to be much difference. They're saying to the family, look, we did the best we could for you as kids. And in a sense, it's telling the story in that way, all the highlights and the ideal parts, that uh, creates a whole set of gaps and absences that you can't fill the rest in. The photographs that coming from outside would inform the photographs that were taken or desired for the family album. And so women's magazines or photography magazines where women are always coded in certain ways. Slim, desirable, young, plucked and made up. The whole picture that really the press hinged onto was the one of me as a 45-year-old nude lying on my stomach like a baby. But I thought that if I showed that I wasn't slim and lovely and that I do wear glasses, nudes never wear glasses, you see. So that, I was trying to say that uh, 
I don't mind conforming to the conventions, but I want to have some control over them. I'm going to leave my glasses on and I'm not going to hide things. And hopefully that way I wouldn't be a sex object. But I think that's debatable. This was actually quite a, a brave act. The idea of having photographs of oneself put on display, photographs from the past, good photographs, bad photographs, was quite an unusual thing to turn into a public statement. One of the sources of inspiration was Berthold Brecht. He juxtaposed news photographs of war with poetic texts, but commented critically. So that technique applied to the family album meant she started to caption the photographs not just as they would have been captioned, but by creating an alternative narrative, a commentary on the desires, but also on the stories of pain and toil and strife and sometimes even trauma, that the photographs were also, in a sense, hiding. She always saw her work as being not just for the gallery wall, but as something to reach other people in ways that were, in a sense, educational. And I think that's one of the things that makes her work really, really powerful. It would be really nice if we had more realistic images of ourselves, but it's how a photograph's used that's also important. And I think that the more people that begin to create their own images and use them in community newspapers, you know, minority magazines, whatever, or even in their own albums, in a way, it's a tiny wedge against the massive onslaught from the media. I think that if you can stop being an object, if you like, as a woman, and become a subject, you can actually begin to think it's possible to change the world. The red stilettos are such a powerful cliché of sexy woman. Red stiletto, fishnet stockings, they're almost like over-determining this idea of seductiveness. But then, of course, what she does is add the vacuum cleaner. And in a, in a very simple way, it's a reference to the conflicting and overlapping demands of women. Yes, you have to be sexy, but also you have to have done the cleaning. The idea of being sexy, but also in the investment in being the perfect housewife, are actually quite powerful narratives that women find difficult to stop desiring. They actually make them quite difficult to disentangle and make them quite difficult to just uh, deny and step away from. The really big crisis came in the mid-80s when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was really shocked when she found herself being confronted by a doctor coming in with a retinue of students and simply using a felt tip to mark the breast, saying this is the one to go. Before I went into hospital, I got Terry, who I live with, to take this photograph of me. And I took it into hospital as a kind of tal talisman or magical fetish to remind myself I had some rights over my body. I'm not, I wasn't sure what they were at the time, but I needed a reminder that I might actually have to say no. What I did to help myself and to lessen my fear was to take my camera into hospital each time I went. I know it sounds a bit daft, but it was a bit like having a friend with me. And I wanted to keep a kind of visual diary of something that frightened me. In fact, I had to negotiate to take some of them by lying. Of course, immediately the photograph became a way to share the realisation uh, that actually part of a journey of recovering from cancer would have to be her taking active control of her own health rather than just relying on doctors. Her work was quite influential as part of a whole movement of patients' rights. 
In this body of work called The Picture of Health, we see Joe Spence standing, looking, confronting the viewer in a gesture that is both protecting herself, to some extent she's covering her face and protecting her identity, but she's also being quite defiant, almost aggressive. If you're wearing a helmet in it, when you're not on a boat or bicycle, the assumption is that you might be doing something violent, something dangerous. And underneath the helmet, she's completely naked, and she's showing off the scar. Again, in defiance of what cancer treatment and post-care at the time, which was all about hiding from yourself, from your partner, from other people. She's also parodying the pose often used in glamour photography because it makes the breasts look more pert. As the title suggests, the final project is in fact her last. She was ill again with leukemia and she knew that this time she was confronting death. She was committed to carry on representing herself, but also others, up until the end. And one of the things that she hit upon was this simple technique of sandwiching slides. So that, for example, she could insert a body in different natural settings slides that she was taking during the making of this, but also that referenced past projects as a way to, in a sense, use photography to go through that journey, to attempt to represent the unrepresentable. I think in some ways she would have been really excited by the ways in which now photography can be practiced by everyone. But at the same time, she would have been possibly dismayed at the way in which some of the concerns of her own practice about transforming oneself, for example, have become co-opted within the capitalist and commercial world, so that transforming oneself is no longer a political act, but it's a culture of makeover. Because we live in a world where images are so widespread, are so imbricated in people's everyday life, often blurring boundaries between what is private and what is public, what is personal and what is shared by millions of strangers, that visual literacy is even more important as something that really should be taught to everybody from quite a young age. <laughs>